All right, so welcome to Screencast. This is weathering and erosion. A little presentation on that. You should have in front of you your notes that you received today in class. It's going to zip through some of the stuff. I'm not really going to sit here and read you every slide. That would be silly goose eggish. Instead, I'll give you the highlights as you go through. You can always pause, rewind, and uh, commit this entire thing to memory. So if you think about weathering, erosion, there's another term you probably heard associated with it is deposition. Weathering is when stuff's broken down. Erosion is when that broken down material is carried away. And then deposition is where it's deposited somewhere else. So you can see over here, there used to be the rock used to go straight across like this. But something took this material and then carried it away. So weathering would it be broke, uh, breaking down and then erosion would be carried away. And deposition is wherever it winds up. So we're going to concern ourselves with two types of weathering. We're going to focus on weathering first, and that's going to be uh, physical weathering and chemical weathering. Last year you should have done physical change, chemical change, to kind of refresh your memory. A physical change would be if I take a piece of paper, and if I rip that piece of paper, that would be a physical change. It's still paper, it hasn't been changed chemically. You just change the shape of it or the size of it. Um, chemical change of paper would be burning it, which you should not do. Um, but that gets changed chemically. Oxidized to be specific. Uh, another example would be a bicycle. If you cut a bicycle in half with a hacksaw, which you shouldn't do either, um, that would be an example of a physical change. If the bicycle rusted, that's oxidizing, um, that would be a chemical change. So. So any type of breakdown of the rock, whether it's chemical or physical, will be referred to as weathering. In this case, this example is a physical change on the left-hand side, basically like the piece of paper being ripped. Um, this rock has been broken or cracked. Here you can see some of the evidence of chemical change that you see rusting going on. Uh, but weathering occurs when we have exposure to the air, but the scientific term for air is atmosphere, the water scientific term is hydrosphere, and actions of living things, which they term as biological activity, which could be animals digging a hole, worms digging holes, insects, um, and also another type could be roots from plants, trees, shrubs, anything breaking into the soil and the rock material and breaking it apart. So we already talked about this. Physically changing it, you're not changing the chemical compounds of it. Um, it can happen with frost action, which another term is ice wedging, uh, plant root growth or root action, um, and changes in temperature, abrupt changes in particular, can break down the rock physically, not chemically. All right, physical uh, weathering is also called mechanical. There's always like two or three different names for everything, right? So in this case, the pipe on the upper right-hand corner has experienced some type of frost action. There was water in the pipe. Unfortunately, the water froze inside the pipe. Water expands about 10%. It's a little bit over 9. We're going to round up to 10%. When it freezes, it gets larger. If you have a placed a bottle in a freezer, a plastic bottle in a freezer, and it cracked, um, that's because the water in it expanded to the, to the point that the container couldn't hold it, and it cracked it. So in this case, the pipe cracked because the water in it expanded to the point that it cracked the pipe. Here's an illustration of how rocks can experience the same thing. So you have a tiny crack, or in this case a pretty large crack. Water gets in there, that water over time freezes. If it's there, it remains in there. That um, water expands 10%, applying pressure, and that pressure could reach the point where that rock can't hold anymore. Um, and that rock could come tumbling down. If you've ever been near cliffs before, you'll see a whole lot of rock fall at the base of the cliffs. It's called talus, a talus field. Perhaps you've heard of it. Um, and that's resulting from this type of physical weathering, in this case, water ice wedging getting in there, freezing, expanding, and falling down. Generally, you get more ice wedging in areas that not only are cold enough to freeze, but warm enough to melt. And if you think about it, the, the crack will get larger over time. So water gets in there, freezes. Expansion, rock moves a little bit. It melts. More water gets in. It freezes again. Expansion, that rock moves even further apart. So the crack gets larger and larger and larger. So frost action or ice wedging, same thing by the way, uh, occurs, uh, is magnified more in areas where it, the temperature goes above the freezing point and then below the freezing point. 
So some place like the North Pole doesn't really get warm enough for it to have a lot of ice wedging. It still has some, but an area like, let's say, upstate New York would have more because it gets warm enough that more water can melt and go in there and then freeze again, expand 10%, making the crack larger and larger and larger. All examples of physical weathering. So again, that's what this slide is basically talking about. With frost wedging, you get angular. You tend to get angular. See how straight these lines are, right? Not rounded. Uh, running water, think about running water in a river. Those rocks tend to be rounded more. Um, here is an illustration, and then the actual picture. Obviously, the illustration was not done by me, but water gets into the crack, freezes, and pushes the rock further apart from the pressure of that water expanding by that 10%. A blurry illustration, but an illustration none, nonetheless of water getting into the cracks, freezing, given enough periods of freezing, melting, freezing, melting, freezing, melting, this rock will crack and uh, get pushed further and further apart. You can understand that if it only froze once, as in the case of, let's say, the North Pole or the South Pole, you're not going to have as much of an expansion happening because it only freezes that one time. So it's important that you would want the area to freeze, melt, freeze, melt. I've said that enough times. Just a quick little reminder, picture before, but here you can see that this crack is getting larger because it, again, it freezes, melts, freezes, melts. And on the right is the introduction to root action, which again is physical change. This root growing into the rock, breaking the rock apart, wedging between a crack and getting larger and larger and larger. You can see this in upstate New York. Um, there, are, there are trees that actually grow into the cliffs. The type of tree is pitch pine. Um, and it pushes the rock apart, breaks the rock apart. Again, a physical change to the rock or physical weathering. You see evidence of this all over your neighborhood, perhaps. Your sidewalks, if you have trees, the roots go underneath the sidewalks. The sidewalks get pushed up, they get cracked. Um, that's a physical change. The root action going into the rock itself, you can see this in woods all over the place. Um, and that's physical change or physical weathering that occurs. It doesn't need to be trees necessarily. It could be small grasses. Uh, shrubs getting into um, the cracks within the rock, breaking down that rock material by the root action, a physical change that happens, which can be aided by biological activity, in particular little animals digging small little holes, um, allowing more exposure to the atmosphere and the hydrosphere, therefore increasing weathering. Again, more examples of root action that happens, biological activity, you can see some root action as well in the same picture. How exciting. Ooh. Abrasion. Think about abrasion like sandpaper, right? Material grinding against another material. So if you in technology, if you use sandpaper to make your CO2 car, that's an example of abrasion. It can happen with ice in, a term, in, in terms of glaciers, running water. Water is an abrasive material. Uh, wind picking up sand, that sand particle rubbing up against something like sandblasting is an example of abrasion. These are all physical changes that are happening. The difference with running water is you tend to get rounded rocks. Um, with wind, you tend to get more angular. So you can see the sand can only go so high, the wind can only support the sand for so long, that you tend to get more narrow at the bottom, and it's wider at the top. Better pictures of that later on. Ooh, how exciting. You have a reason to stay tuned. So if you ever been to the beach and wind kicks up and the sand hits you in the face and it hurts, um, that's an example of abrasion. Okay, the sugar cube thing you'll do in class, again, very exciting to know that greater things are to come. This example is wind erosion, sand getting picked up, and you can see the sand can't go to this point, this level of elevation. So you tend to have a, a little more narrow towards the, the base. And rocks are very strong compressionally, so it can support the larger uh, top with a, with a more narrow base because rocks are very strong in a compressional sense. So this is just an example of a glacier moving a, across the land, gouging out material through abrasion, dragging material over it, over the land, through mountains, creating valleys. Um, this is in Ohio. It's a place called Kelly's Island. It's the largest glacial grooves in the world. So a glacier moved through here at one point, 5,280 feet thick or tall, had material stuck in it, and as it moved across, it gouged out this material. You could see evidence of this upstate New York. You don't even have to go that far. You go to Central Park. 
uh, Compset State Park on Long Island, which is in, I think, Lloyd Neck. Uh, but you can see the scratches in the bedrock that exist from the glacier moving across it and having material stuck in it that then scratched the material. You ever see the gigantic boulders in Central Park? Those were transported there by a glacier. Okay, 5,280 feet tall glacier about 10,000 years ago. So here's an example of wind erosion, which is physical weathering, um, and it's abrasion. And you can see that the sand can only go so high, and that's why it's much wider. Given enough time, this material will become so thin that it won't be able to support the weight, and then you'll wind up with a rock that looks something like this. So this rock at one point in time probably resembled this, but given enough time, physical weathering from wind, abrasion took it down to make it look more like that. More examples of wind abrasion. Um, from the sand. And then you have this fancy term exfoliation, also known as, that's what AKA means by the way, unloading. Fancy, fancy term. Use the analogy, it's kind of like peeling the layers off of an onion. Um, so rather than me sit here and reading this to you, I'm just going to show you some diagrams. So if you look, you have a rock underneath. Okay, It's actually called a pluton, but we'll talk about when we do rocks and minerals. The soil above is applying pressure to the rock surface. If this soil gets weathered and eroded away, carried away, you no longer have that pressure pushing down on the pluton anymore, and the rock expands, kind of like it relaxing. Since it's rock material, it cracks. So here's some pictures of exfoliation, Yosemite National Park. You can see all the cracks. So this at one point in time had soil above it that pushed the rock layers down and kept them there. Once that soil was removed, those rock layers expanded and cracked. Here's more examples of exfoliation. You could see this on the throughway on your way to upstate New York. You could see it kind of all over the place. You just have to look for it. And then here's another picture of it. This I found online. Not exactly sure what motivated this person to stand in front of it drinking water from a Sprite bottle with a hat on backwards saying, post it online. I'm not really sure how that happens, but it does. So this is exfoliation. And now these cracks allow what? Water to get in there, ice wedging, plants to get in there, root action all physical weathering that's occurring, given enough time, this rock material is going to slide down the hill through the force of gravity. If you look, these are very angular shaped uh, material. So all talking about physical weathering right here. Another example of exfoliation. Then we get into chemical weathering, things that are rusted. There is a great example of chemical weathering. So um, the tractor getting rusted. It's chemically changed, and therefore it's no longer a physical change, but it's a chemical change. It happens with weathering as well. We have a whole bunch of terms for this. Hydrolysis, it's related to water. Now, last year you learned that dissolving is a, chemi uh, is a physical change, I apologize. But here, when, the, when rock material dissolves in water, it's now dissolved, it's now in solution, and now it can react with other chemicals that are in the water. And that's how rock material dissolving in water is actually a chemical weathering because those minerals react chemically with another material that's in the water, and that's why it's technically considered chemical weathering, which is a little bit confusing. Carbonation, think about carbonated beverages. You have water, carbon dioxide gets in the water, for example, rain precipitation, it then becomes acidic and becomes acid rain. So you can see evidence of that. A good example is Cleopatra's needle. A couple of thousand years it existed in Egypt, perfectly fine. It was given to New York City as a gift, brought to Central Park. From all that rain, precipitation, a lot of it acid rain because of all the pollution, weathered it, chemically weathered the material. You also had some physical weathering happening too. You had ice wedging, frost action, and all that other stuff happening. But you can see in a couple of decades, this is what happened. They went up moving it inside, um, but it's kind of a shame. So you can see clear as a bell all the hieroglyphics, which kind of resembles my handwriting on the board. Um, and then it gets uh, chemically weathered from acid rain in New York City. Kind of upsetting, right? Um, here's acid rain effects on sculptures. You can see the details in the face. In 1908, 1969, the face is unrecognizable. Okay. Um, oxidation is a fancy term that we use. Basically, it's rusting. So the surface of Mars is highly oxidized, which means it probably at one point had water covering its surface. It happens a lot with material that contains iron, 
Right, so uh, the surface of Mars probably has a lot of, of rocks in it that have iron. The water reacted with it uh, chemically and it oxidized and became something completely different. Okay, so when we meet tomorrow, we'll talk about factors that affect weathering. How exciting. You probably won't be able to sleep, but do your best.